at least, is that correct, Natalie? Yes, we are on air. Um, yes. So welcome, everybody. Uh, I hope that, uh, welcome, at least from where I am, from the frigid northeast quadrant of the United States. I hope that wherever you're joining us from or wherever you're watching this streamed on, it is uh, a little bit nicer uh, and warmer. But nevertheless, we are incredibly excited to have everyone here today. Uh, my name is Luke Blocher. I'm with the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center here in Cincinnati. Uh, we are hosting this hangout today jointly with our great friends at Made in a Free World and Slavery Footprint. And of course, we're incredibly honored to have Ambassador Lou DeBaca here participating today. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about what we're going to do today, and then I'm going to jump into the, to the agenda. Um, what we're going to talk about today, as we talked about in the event page description, is this idea of, of how the, the history of, uh, of the Underground Railroad and abolition uh, of slavery, of chattel slavery in this country's history, is applicable, is inspirational, is inf informational to those of us who are in the struggle against modern slavery today. Uh, and you know, we're hosting this from the Freedom Center because that goes to the core of who we are and what we're trying to do with our institution. Uh, we are based here in Cincinnati. Uh, where much of the activity of the Underground Railroad happened crossing the Ohio River, where we actually I'm looking out my window at the Ohio River right now. Uh, so the place is very important for us, but the message um, we believe strongly is universal. And it goes to the core a lot of what, what, what I think we're all trying to do, which is bring people to freedom. And, uh, and part of the message here is that that's a timeless struggle. Uh, and that's something that has been going on for, for generations and centuries. Uh, and it's been working for generations and centuries. So there's inspiration, there's also uh, awareness of kind, of kind of where we've come from, but also where we continue to need to struggle against. Um, and you know, ultimately, that at the, free, at the National Underground Rail and Freedom Center, that's what we are about. We are an organization that tells the stories uh, of freedom's heroes from the era of the Underground Railroad, beginning with that era, but bringing it forward to uh, contemporary times and contemporary movements for justice and freedom and equality and dignity. And the idea that those stories and that history can not only inform people and help them understand uh, their current context a little bit better by connecting it with what's happened in the past, but also I think on a deeper level be inspired and empowered by the idea that there's been individuals just like them who've been doing things just like this throughout history. Uh, and at the time they were doing it, it sure didn't seem like it was easy and it sure didn't seem like it was inevitable that it was gonna work. Uh, but we can look back on it now and know that it did work and we can know that those people were indeed heroes. Um, and so we think that uh, for someone thinking about what they're going to do today to stand up for justice and freedom and all in those human rights we talk about, uh, knowing that there is this historical legacy that you're following in, uh, we believe is an empowering message. It's one that we try to share in everything we're doing. And it goes to the core of this film that we were so uh, uh, grateful to be a part of with the State Department and with Justin at Slavery Footprint and Made in a Free World um, and Fair Trade Pictures. Uh, this film, Journey to Freedom, which we posted in the uh, event page, and we hope that many of you got a chance to see it, and if you haven't, that you will get a chance to look at it afterwards. Uh, we think it's incredibly well done, and uh, very briefly, it tells the story of two individuals, one Solomon Northrop, who was a free black man in 1840 in upstate New York, and another gentleman named Prum Vanak, who was a Cambodian with a young family uh, just a few years ago, both of whom sto whose stories were eerily similar. They both went looking for work to support their families, were trafficked into slavery, spent years being forced to work against their will until due to their own incredible courage and perseverance and then the intervention of some committed abolitionists were able to come to freedom. And the film tells those personal stories in a really powerful way that shows the similarities and connections, but then it also, uh, it also tells about the roles that individuals have played in both areas that are similar, that repeat. The roles of uh, advocates, of caretakers, of defenders, of people who provide uh, sanctuary. Uh, those roles repeat throughout time and they're roles that individuals choose to take on. Um, but the effect they have is a multiplier effect because when there's lots of people doing this, it's not just the individual taking a step, it's the, it's the effect of this entire network of people. And we believe in, uh, that that's happening again today in, in similar ways to the way it happened in the Underground Railroad era. Uh, and that's a lot of what we're trying to do is help build up that network through this message. So that's in a lot of ways what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and I'm just so excited to have two of the best possible people we could have to talk about this message uh, and Ambassador DeBaca and, uh, and Justin Dillon. Uh, very briefly, <laughs> Ambassador DeBaca is the uh, director of the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons. He is the, really the head of U.S. policy uh, on, on this issue 
within the State Department and has been more than that, in my opinion. This is me speaking, a leader for this uh, from the very beginning and someone who I've um, really come to admire deeply and respect deeply. Um, we also have Justin Dillon, who uh, is many things, including, uh, I hope, my good friend. Uh, he is um, uh, the creator, the CEO, President and CEO of Slavery Footprint. He also is the uh, head of In the Free World, which he's going to talk a little more about what that organization is doing, uh, and also uh, a really incredible musician, uh, and who has also been, and also a documentary filmmaker who has made several documentary films, including Call and Response, uh, and our wonderful film Journey to Freedom. I should mention that Journey to Freedom, before we get into the discussion, was also supported very um, uh, significantly and importantly by Google, who we are very happy to be partners with, and of course the State Department itself. Um, I'm going to get to our discussion here. The way this is all going to work, just so everyone knows who's, on, who's joined here, we're going to have a discussion with Justin, the ambassador, right now that I'm going to moderate. And then at the close of that, we're going to have an opportunity for questions for the ambassador. Uh, that'll probably be about 20, 25 minutes into this. Uh, at that point, then, we're going to switch to this idea of kind of what can you be doing now? What are the ways individuals can join the network and take action? And Justin's going to speak to what's happening at Made in a Free World. Uh, Greg Darley from International Justice Mission is going to speak to their uh, student mobilization effort, Stand for Freedom. And uh, Matt Mason, a professor from Brigham Young University, is going to speak about an organization called Historians Against Slavery, who uh, is working closely with us, with us at the Freedom Center and others to kind of bring this history connector together and has been screening the film Journey to Freedom quite a bit. It's going to talk about that process. Uh, so with that, with, without any further ado, I'm going to jump into this discussion. Uh, um, and I'm going to have the first question here for, first of all, let me just say welcome, Ambassador. Welcome, Justin. Thank you both very, very much for being here today. It's a pleasure. Um, Ambassador, the first question is for you. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, you really helped develop the concept for this film, Journey to Freedom, uh, and you helped lead the realization of this coming to happen. Uh, to pass, and then you. This was ultimately, in its first instance, produced for use by the State Department uh, at, at events throughout the world. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why you wanted to do that? Why you think this message is important? And then also, what um, what the feedback or reaction has been to the showing of these events or showing of the film throughout the throughout the world? You know, I think one of the things Luke, that we've seen is that the um, fight against modern slavery ends up having to use many of the same techniques that the fight against antebellum slavery use, whether that's um, community groups, the faith community, uh, whether it's uh, storytelling, um, using new technologies. Back in the 1840s, those new technologies were, you know, the railroad meant that an abolitionist or even a freed slave might be able to come to your town um, for the first time ever. Um, and you could see somebody who had lived through this and hear their story. Um, the telegraph and, and advances in printing um, and uh, illustrating uh, enabled you to see those people's lives. The same thing with, you know, whether we're talking about what Google's able to do uh, through the Hangouts, uh, what we're able to do with uh, film, what we're able to do with music. Um, as Justin's earlier movie, Call and Response, I think really uh, points out that, you know, song and uh, storytelling um, as a way to confront this, it's not only the way that the people who are enslaved confront their suffering, but it's also uh, the way to undo it. And I think that that's really what we're seeing here when we thought about having uh, the, the film was really a way to, to say how do we take the promise of emancipation um, not the historic date of emancipation or the historic act of emancipation but the promise of emancipation and how do we deliver on that dr king said it best 50 years ago at the at the march on washington uh, when in the opening lines of uh, his uh, his I Have a Dream speech, he talks about the Emancipation Proclamation as being, in effect, uh, a promissory note that's never been fully cashed. I think we have to look at that 50 years later and not just think about President Lincoln's promise, but Dr. King's challenge. It's how do we actually deliver on that to make sure, as Frederick Douglass said in, 19, in 1867, uh, that the fight uh, for African freedom from chattel slavery did not simply devolve over into the de facto enslavement of new immigrants and others, um, what we would now call by this umbrella term human trafficking. So that's really the kind of the impetus for this. Um, as far as what the response has been around the world, you know, we've had uh, 
25 to 30 embassies so far, and I think we're going to have another tranche uh, coming up in the next few weeks, uh, who've been using this as a way to celebrate the 150th anniversary of emancipation, but also to challenge themselves and, and the countries that they're in uh, to really come together on this. And every, everywhere from you know Australia to uh, Mauritania, from uh, Haiti, um, you know, Central Asian republics. I mean, it's interesting to see how uh, well the embassy community is responding, but also then being able to bring people in. So just one perfect example um, in Mauritania, um, you know, hereditary chattel slavery was only abolished in Mauritania within the last five or six years. And there were people that came to the embassy for the reception where our ambassador showed this film. And then afterwards, it was the first time where people who had been in slavery in Mauritania and whose children maybe haven't even fully been emancipated yet, um, were able to confront the cabinet ministers and the government actors who were there and say, why aren't we moving faster on this? You know, this is affecting my family still. Um, it's the kind of conversations that you know, may be sometimes a little uncomfortable, um, but the conversations that needed to be had that would never have happened if this film hadn't brought together uh, people and let them see that this is something that, that the United States is committed to as much now as it was 150 years ago. Hmm. Wonderful. Um, Justin, let me, let me jump off that and ask you a question. Um, I'm, I touched on this briefly um, about the network concept that really lies at the heart of this. Um, uh, when it, when it comes to what individuals can do today and the inspirational message around this. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know, how, you, how that came to pass and also sort of what, 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 you, what you see as the power of that message? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the concept of the film was, to, the, the, the hope of the film was to see if, what kind of parallels we could find between um, modern day abolitionist and um, historical abolitionist. And, you know, initially we went after types of people and what, um, what types of traits and backgrounds and whatnot they have. But the more and more that we kind of did a, a one to one comparison of the types of individuals that are used to bring people to freedom, historically, we found that there was some parallels between the, 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 the journey that must be taken to, you know, rescue, uh, rehabilitate, um, and then many, many times uh, enlist um, that survivor into the fight itself. It's, it's uncanny, actually, how many uh, parallels that we see in that. So, like, any time you make a documentary or even, you know, even make any type of art, um, you really are looking to try to pull something out or shine a light on something that maybe has been super obvious but hasn't been, um, hasn't been um, highlighted yet. And so the network concept really kind of came out of, to be totally honest, just kind of a hope that I've always had and, and part of the message that, that we try to share with our organization in that um, uh, it, it really takes – a village. It really takes a network of people with, with all different types of skills. And I, I would say that the, the skills and, and, and that we highlighted in the network really are only part of the skills. I think we highlighted four or, or five different types of individuals, both modern and historical. But really, there's a lot of individuals in the, you know, um, in, in the midst of that as well that, that maybe we didn't highlight. You know, this is, there's um, you know, the artists are a big part of the network that don't typically get talked about because um, it, it seems, well, that's just awareness or you're just bringing it to light. But when you think of what an artist or an author can do and can, can bring to light on this or a photographer can do, um, it, it really is, becomes a critical piece that really no one else could play their role without it. So for me, it was personally very fulfilling to get to kind of dive into how the network works. And I think it's important for us today to take courage from that um, and to not, uh, to continue to promote that idea that this is a network and that there is no reason to disenfranchise anyone's um, participation in it, no matter what um, skill set they bring. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, 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 when I reflect back on the film and, and when I watch it and think about it, I, I, I often have the same thought that you just articulated of there's so many other things we could have, other examples you could have included in here that would have been equally mm. as powerful, I think, and, um, and equally as inspirational. I think that points to this larger, this larger point you're making, which is it's a, it's a pretty big story and there's lots of roles to play. Um, I'm just reflecting back. I'm just, I hope folks on this, hang on, might watch this sometime, the abolitionist special, which is on PBS right now, which is uh, really well done. And uh, I just watched the, the story of Angelina Grimke, who uh, you know, wrote this incredible truth telling book about uh, slavery as it is. And well, all she did was collect articles about, uh, uh, you know, uh, fugitive slave wanted ads and was able to uh, basically, by showing people what's actually happening, have an enormous effect. And I think that goes a lot to what some of what you're talking about, all these different roles, and, and there's many of them that can have big, big impacts. Yeah. Um, well, look, I want to, if I could, I'd like, like yeah. to give a little bit of a pitch. And I know that we're going to hear from uh, folks from Historians Against Slavery uh, later in the presentation, but you know, one of the things that was great about the, the abolitionist um, uh, miniseries, is what I'm calling it, um, on uh, PBS, um, was for me the notion that so many of the, the folks from the academic community that are commenting and analyzing what was happening in, uh, in that time period are now becoming engaged and involved with historians against slavery, whether it's mm. uh, uh, Professor Stewart up in, uh, up in Minnesota, um, David Bright, who just brought a bunch of folks together um, at Yale at the Gilder Lerman Center uh, to study slavery um, and looked at modern slavery. It was the first time I think that a lot of antebellum specialists had started to look at, at modern slavery. And that was so powerful. And I think it's that kind of cultural grounding that enables us to place this modern movement um, in an actual context, as opposed to, you know, frankly, for a part of the, this last decade, we may, you know, have all collectively kind of thought that we'd come out of nowhere or that we were inventing the fight against human trafficking. We were inventing the fight against slavery. I think we're much stronger as a movement if we are within a cultural context of the inexorable uh, move towards more freedom for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. Yeah, that is. And, and, and uh, Ambassador, we missed each other briefly at that conference, but it was an incredibly powerful one. Uh, and I'll do a little plug and say that much of the conference is available on C-SPAN, so I'd, I'd encourage folks to watch the videos. Um, uh, getting back to this back and forth, and both of you, feel free to jump in at any point. This is, a, this is a discussion with us, so jump in with thoughts you have. Um, Justin, you've, you've in, in, in a lot of your work, including call and response back um, to, to the beginnings of, of this part of your career, um, you've talked about the, the, the connection of history, the inspiration of history. Um, and I felt in our work with you that that was something that was very present throughout. Um, can you talk a little more about you know, what that's meant for you personally in the work you've been doing? Yeah, I, I think that, that it's, uh, I mean, these types of discussions are, um, are very nourishing to me uh, as, a, as, a, what, as a practitioner. I mean, this is my job. I get up every day just like you do, and just like the ambassador does, and tries to figure out how we can best free people. That's, it's, a, it's a unique and strange job, but that really is when I drive to work, that's what I'm thinking about. How can I bring to bear what I've got, what postage stamp impact I can possibly make, how can we make that and, and leverage that um, uh, to free people? And so for, for me personally, connecting to the historical um, does more for me um, personally from uh, um, not just substantiating what we're trying to do, but also just personally uh, moving me towards um, court courage. You know, I, I, I've just recently been um, learning about, uh, uh, you know, the, the reading King Leopold's Ghost and, and, and learning about what's happening in the Congo at, at the end of the uh, 1800s and, and listening to or, or reading about how, um, uh, I believe is Alice Harris who, who took these pictures of, of, of what Leopold's army was, or, or whatever you want to call him, was doing to the, in his little fiefdom in the Cong Congo, trying to produce raw materials for the developing Western world. And, and 
she happened to have, she was fortunate enough to have one of the coolest, you know, the coolest devices of her day, which was, would blow away any iPhone today. She happened to have a, a camera, which weighed, you know, up, up, upwards of 100 pounds. And she just happened to have it when someone came in and, you know, brought a bag of, of um, her, his, his daughter's um, limbs that, that someone had cut off in, in, the, in the effort to um, procure uh, raw materials for the West. And she just, she pushed herself to, to use what she had at her disposal and it completely changed the game. And it got all the, I mean, over, over what, eight, eight to 10 years, it ended up, uh, Leopold had, had to back out. And it, it just amazes me when, I, when we read that these, these people pushing into the darkness, pushing into or out of a comfort zone, and what happens because of that, the chain reaction that happens, the things that we're doing today, we don't really know how it's all going to connect. And I think sometimes we want the reaction to happen right now because we live in such an immediate gratification environment. But when I look historically at how some young missionary lady just pulling out her camera, starting to take pictures, and what that ended up doing, it gives me great hope for the small things that we do in our office every day or the chances or the risks that all of us take. What's that going to mean over the next 10 to 20 years? Mm -hmm. I think his, his history proves that these small actions pushing out of our comfort zones have tremendous results, and that gives me a lot of courage. That is incredibly well said, and that is, uh, again, that's at the core of what we try to do at the Freedom Center every day, and we, we couldn't agree more with that statement. And I think, you know, it's important to note that you, you bring up a different, a, a different era than uh, the Underground Railroad and Abolition Era, but the point is those people, they're existing throughout history, and those roles and those actions, they're repeating, and you can, I think, find yourselves in those um, if you learn about it. You can find that inspiration. Um, you, you, you make this, you, my next question really goes to a point you just made about you can, you know, part of what makes something history is we know what happened on some level. We know how it turned out. Um, and, you know, in the 1820s and 30s, when, when the, abolition, the American abolitionists really started moving, uh, there really wasn't very much reason to be hopeful. Uh, we now know what happened uh, 40 years later. But, uh, you know, it, it's important to have that historical perspective. And I, and I want to ask both of you guys, I'd ask the ambassador first, can you, can you try to think about what moment we might be in now? Um, you know, if we're in the midst of a movement, or maybe it's not a movement yet, but in this struggle against modern slavery, and if, we want, if we're able to magically transport ourselves to the future and be historians, where do you think you might say we are right now? I actually think that we might be at the place of what I would think is almost the greatest risk, um, which is um, the, that it's... A lot of folks are coming to the issue right now. They're very interested in the issue. Um, mm -hmm. And if the movement doesn't give a sustaining uh, way of working on this issue, um, this will be the thing that this generation um, of millennials or others will 15 or 20 years from now say, oh yeah, I remember when we all did X. Um, you know, I kind of think it's, it's somewhat like when you know, people in the Chicano community you know, think about the great boycott from back in the day, but nobody, uh, you know, people are reminiscing about the great boycott while they're not really doing anything to help the farm workers of today. Um, you know, the first, one of the movements um, of, against this issue um, back in uh, the 19, early 1900s um, was the passage of the Mann Act and, and the notion of what they called at the time the white slave traffic, which was a euphemism uh, for moving prostitutes internationally. And there were all sorts of, of um, testimonies about what was happening to the women from Eastern Europe who'd be brought to the United States or otherwise. Um, horrible, horrible uh, things that were happening to them in the brothels, and et cetera. Um, and then suddenly, um, within five or 10 years, people had moved on to other issues and never really thought about it again for another generation. I think that's what keeps me up at night um, which is that notion of that the excitement that people have in wanting to confront this needs to be something that's not just click-through activism. It's not just a, a, a short-term 
you know, I'm going to work on sweatshop issues when I'm a sophomore in college and then tell stories about it when I'm 40. Um, but rather, we have to have career paths for people to be abolitionists. We have to have a long-term um, plan to make sure that people can continue to come in and work in this field and continue to go out and, and fight those fights. Because otherwise what happens is that, you know, you get the flavor of the month. Uh, people uh, in, you know, when people in Europe stood up against the abuses in the Congo, um, a lot of rubber plantations in western Brazil uh, and far northeastern Bolivia suddenly became slave camps. Uh, but the Europeans didn't really do much about that because they had signed up for an effort against what was happening in the Congo. Um, so I think that we have to make sure, and we can do this now better than I think at any time in, in the past because of technology, um, because of the ability to, to bring the movements together, um, where we can make it a long-term and sustainable movement. So I actually think that the risk that I'm talking about um, as far as where we are as a movement is also the opportunity, um, but it's only going to be an opportunity if we grab it for the long haul. Hmm. Justin, do you have any thoughts on that question? Yeah, I, I, you know, when I was actively playing music and, and, and touring and whatnot, we, we'd always have this, uh, we'd always have this phrase that we'd say when we'd, we'd see a new band up on stage really working very hard to, um, to make sure that we know how, how great they were. We would always say, I wish they would let us discover how cool they are instead of telling us. And, um, I sometimes feel that way about calling this a movement. I feel like a movement is a fantastic marketing term, but it's one that should be, um, uh, should be offered by history and nothing else. I think to call something a movement is like saying something's historical. It's really impossible to say something's historical right now. History is going to choose what's historical. And I think that if we're focusing so much on our marketing, um, on talking about what we're doing, then that's a lot of energy spent in a direction that might not actually be helping people. It's just, it feels like energy that, now I understand we need to do that to get people, to get, get people excited and a part of it. And I'm, I, um, I'm an absolute sucker for enthusiasm and, um, and marketing. Uh, it's a big part of what we do. But I think that we have to clearly be able to outline what, what success looks like um, I think history will look back on how success was achieved, not about how much we were able to talk about what we were doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, I would actually like to keep this going for hours uh, if, I was, if I was, had all the time in the world, but we've got to kind of move through the agenda here and I'm mindful of the ambassador's time as well. Um, so I'm going to move to the Q&A for him right now. Uh, I've got a couple questions that have come in through the event page um, that I'll give to you, Ambassador, and, um, and then I also want to give you a chance to have any closing remarks um, before we move on. Um, the first question, I'm going to slightly modify these because a couple of them sort of run into each other. But um, there's a question about um, what, there's a question about the state of legislation within the U.S. today, um, and where we are federally and within the states about legislation against dealing with this question domestically, which I know is not, um, is, is part of what you, you deal with, certainly something you've dealt with throughout your career. Um, can you maybe just say kind of where things are with that right now, maybe more to the point of where does it need to go if you have an opinion about that? You know, right now there is a, um, there's a bill, um, well, there was at the end of Congress, um, a bill that reauthorized the anti-trafficking legislation. Um, and that didn't move in the 112th Congress. We're hoping that it'll be reintroduced with perhaps some changes um, that would make it a better, um, a better bill. But, um, you know, I think that one of the things that people need to realize is the reauthorization. This isn't like some laws that have a sunset clause where suddenly there's no ability for the government to do its work if the sunset uh, time comes and the law hasn't been, re been reauthorized. So we're continuing to do our work. The appropriators can continue to appropriate money. Um, in many ways, I certainly suggest um, that the energy of folks in the anti-trafficking world 
um, is perhaps best uh, spent talking to the appropriators. The notion of how much money um, is getting spent on uh, human trafficking. We're uh, certainly going to support uh, whatever uh, Congress gives us and, and what's in the, the president's budget, and we'll spend that money wisely on projects, not just projects like uh, the slavery footprint and, and uh, the uh, journey to freedom, but projects that give direct services to victims in countries around the world. Um, but that's something that I think that you know the activism, uh, frankly, has not been as great on. There's more money uh, appropriated by Congress for wildlife trafficking um, or the trafficking in antiquities than, than there are uh, for uh, the fight against trafficking in persons. So I think that you know this is definitely one of those call your congressman moments uh, if uh, folks want to get engaged. Um, we were very happy to see yesterday during the the confirmation hearing for uh, Secretary Designate Kerry. Not only did uh, did John Kerry uh, have this uh, in his uh, opening remarks as, as far as something that he wanted to work on, uh, but in response to questions, uh, it was something that he would come back to. Uh, the plight of the human trafficking victim, I think, is something that he understands from his time uh, as having been a prosecutor back in the 70s, um, but also uh, those of you who may have seen it on C-SPAN, the hearing that he held uh, last uh, summer on the issue. So I think we not only have an opportunity on the Hill going forward, but we also have a Secretary of State uh, who is going to continue the commitment um, that uh, his predecessor uh, was able to bring to this. Well, and I've, I've heard you say, uh, I of course too was very heartened by uh, Senator Kerry's remarks, and I've heard you say this before, that the, um, the, the, the federal legislative structure around trafficking really started before there was a big public groundswell, and in many ways the public groundswell needs to catch up to that. Uh, and I think it's an important message, maybe it's obvious, but to the call your congressman point, uh, politicians and public officials are fundamentally responsive to public pressure. And so uh, they are going to respond if people are demanding some sort of action around this. And, uh, you know, I think that that voice will matter when people give voice to it. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you one more question quickly. Um, uh, there's several for you, as you can imagine. Uh, this one was regards. Uh, there's a couple questions that come in. Want to do a speed round, Luke? I, I mean, just hit me with some synopsis, and I can try to, you know. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, speed round number one: uh, refugees in the Sudan and trafficking happening around there um, as a as a as a recent concern. Kind of, what are your thoughts on that issue, and what might be being done about it? You know, I think one of one of the challenges is that you know, with the splitting of Sudan into two countries, um, we're we're having to reload. Um, you know, our engagement, you know, we have now uh, a diplomatic presence in South Sudan. Um, I think one of the biggest things is that we have to make sure that the north-south um, paradigm, which is where so many of the activists were focused and where we were focused, frankly, um, you know, there still is north-south um, kind of traditional slave patterns um, in the Sudan, but also making sure that things like, you know, the new paved roads in the capital and things like that are bringing people in from the rural areas. Um, and we're very nervous about seeing South Sudanese trafficking, where it's South Sudanese girls and women being held in prostitution um, by other South Sudanese. So I think that we're in a really interesting time because it's no longer the kind of uh, what we had expected, which is kind of the Arab North um, preying on the black Christian South, um, but rather the notion that human trafficking can happen anywhere um, and maybe sometimes we'll challenge some of our own assumptions. Um, well, I'm going to actually now just go straight to any sort of uh, last thoughts you would have um, uh, while we still have you here, because I'm mindful of your time. Uh, Super. So. No, and I, I apologize that I have to that I have to run. You know, I think one of the things that that I've been thinking a lot in, over the last uh, week or so, with you know, when the president talked about uh, in the inaugural address, you know, kind of some of those touchstones, the notions of um, uh, you know, freedom, the notions of liberty, the notions of, of the fight, um, and what are some of the things that, that bring people to that fight. You know, I think that, that it's that personal connection that people find, whether it's the folks who first saw the, the drawings of, the, of how many people were crammed into a slave ship that the English abolitionists were putting forth in the late 1700s, whether it's the folks in New York 10 years ago who were shocked to find out that there were deaf Mexicans who they'd seen on the subways every day 
trying to peddle those little trinkets, but those people were being abused and exploited, 50 people to an apartment. Um, you know, those, that moment when the slavery around us breaks through and that we have to confront it, that's a moment that you can either be horrified by and then move on, or it's a, a moment that you can actually take it and say, I've, I'm going to spend some of my time on this. This is going to be part of who I am and part of what I do. And I think it's something that you can do no matter who you are and, and what role you're in. If you're a lawyer, you can lawyer for freedom, represent people, uh, help folks. Um, if you're an accountant or somebody that does money management, you know, the, the women and girls and the, the men coming out that are working in the shelters, they need to learn how to, to budget and have a checkbook and all of those things. Um, if you're an advocate, um, bringing it into your own advocacy. I mean, I do think that this is one of those things where no matter what somebody does, there's something that they have that they can bring to this fight. Um, I grew up Catholic in that notion of the, the stone soup supper where once you get the water boiling, uh, people start turning up with a, a carrot or a turnip or a, a bone, and pretty soon you've got a community and they're eating a, a beautiful soup. I mean, I think that that's something that, that we take forward you know, here at the trafficking office is that everyone can be an abolitionist. So thanks, everybody, for joining this. Thanks uh, to uh, the center uh, for uh, hosting. Um, thanks, as always, to Google, um, which I not only use for this, but use many, many, many times a day for just about everything. Um, and uh, thanks for Justin for uh, that awesome chalkboard behind you. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, and um, that's actually a perfect segue to where we're going, that idea that, that there's many roles that everybody, everybody can play as abolitionists. Uh, that is really the core message I think we're at here. And, and I, we're going to hand it back to Justin, who's going to talk about what um, his organization, Slavery Footprint and Made in a Free World, what they're doing that's empowering folks to, to join, this, join this struggle. Yeah, I, I, I think that... Um, just jumping off of the ambassador's remarks, I'm reminded of um, a, a talk that I heard um, or a message that I heard Andrew Young, uh, who was a civil rights leader, worked directly with Martin Luther King. A, 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 a story that he tells about when he went to, when he and King um, went to visit the president. And the president was more or less saying that, um, uh, where he said, I, you know, I've, I've got all this responsibility, but I've, I've got no power to, to give you guys what you want. And, and Andrew said, as, you know, as he was pretty disappointed as they were walking out of, the, uh, out of the West Wing that night. And he said, Martin Luther King turned to him and said, we've got to get this president some power. And it, it was a very unique perspective on not only how things were working then, but how things work now. We often think that the people that are powerful or the places that are powerful can do this all by themselves. And I think that's, um, that's a mistaken philosophy, that somehow power is all absorbed in one place. So when you have a president, as we do, who, uh, who is ambitious on this issue, when you have a secretary of state, when you begin to have institutions, like we're starting to see with... Uh, American Bar Association and other places, you start getting these ivory towers that have um, um, some ambition or some proclivity towards being involved. You know, they, they can only do so much. And I think that what we're trying to do with Slavery Footprint and what we've seen over the last five years, you know, five years ago, having a president talk about this issue or having it be a priority in Secretary of State or even having anyone in any ivory tower talking about it all just seemed like such a dream and now we're starting to see those but the the fight isn't over we actually have to connect the dots and we actually have to give those not just the presidents but those standing in the ivory towers we've got to give them some power some cultural power and what i think those that may be detractors or those who just aren't that interested in this right now i think that they need to see that we are coming together in mass and we're willing to vote whether on election day or at the cash register, to make sure that these values are expressed. So I would say we're in this very tight window of being able to prove the concept that we really do want to fight for freedom for those whom we, we may never meet, but are somehow connected to our lives through the cities we live in or through the products we use. So there needs to be a demonstration, so to speak, that may not necessarily be on Wall Street or outside our city hall, 
but a demonstration in the marketplace that shows that we really are ready to change the way that the world works. And, and this is, when you think about changing the way slavery works, the one thing that touches the entire globe is the marketplace. Ambassador DeBaca and the State Department, they, can, they really can only do so much. And the truth is, no, learning more about how they operate, and I just so adore that office um, and, and the people in that office, I often, when I visit Ambassador DeBaca and, and, and their office, I often walk out feeling the same way, saying, how can we get these folks more power? How can we come around them so that they can do more? It is abysmal when you start looking at how, as a federal government, we spend money and how low of a priority this issue is. That's not because Ambassador DeBaca and his office isn't doing a great job. We're not doing our job. The people that are distributing the money and appropriating it don't think that this is a big enough deal. And we've been doing a lot, but we need to step it up. And so Maine to Free World is our new effort. You know, Slavery Footprint was uh, a way for us to try to understand, to try to prove the concept that the marketplace will bite if we say, did you know that you've got slavery in your products? And we've seen that response come back in mass. And we've been uh, overwhelmed with how many people there are. 2,500 to 3,000 people every day that are spending over eight and a half minutes on our site answering that question for themselves from every country in the world. So this isn't just an, a, a U.S. thing. This is a globe. People are globally thinking about this, and it's increasing every day. So we have an opportunity to be able to start to demonstrate that there is will for this and start to shake the ivory towers that might not be necessarily interested and fortify those ivory towers that want to do more. So Made in the Free World is doing multiple campaigns and kind of connecting the dots. And our tagline, we just launched this year, um, our tagline is let's get slavery out of our system. Because the truth is, I, this isn't going to end in my lifetime. And I want to be able to see that the, the efforts that I and our staff put into this are going to outlive our efforts. That means we have to change the way systems work. We can't just have a, have a moment of expression. We actually have to see where the system isn't working correctly and begin to address it. And I would say even here in the U.S. government and even in our city governments, here, here in Oakland, I'm, I get to see incredible work that Oakland is, is, is doing, but they need to do a whole lot more. From my window, looking that way, I can look down an international boulevard where girls are being sold for sex as young as 13 years old. I can see it from my window. So every day I'm reminded that the systems still need a lot of adjusting. So... If, if the folks who are tuned in today um, are saying to themselves, I want to, okay, I get it. These guys are right. I got something I can do. There's lots of things I can do. What do you want to tell them they can do with, through Made in a Free World? Where do you want to direct them to? Well, the first thing I think everyone should do is to understand their slavery footprint, which we had this crazy idea that, that having, knowing how many slaves work for you would somehow be really cool and inspiring for people. But what we've come to realize is it starts to feel a little bit like a scarlet letter. Uh, nobody really wants to share that number because they feel woefully complicit. I think that the complexity in that is we're saying, you need to engage. Uh, we want you to engage that unwillful complicity and start to do something with it. And Gary Haugen makes such a great point where he says, we, you know, this is one of my favorite Gary Organisms. He says, we move sometimes from not knowing anything about the issue, so we're completely not indifferent, but just knowing nothing about it. Then we learn something about it, and we move into the paralysis of despair. And that's a character issue, and that's something that all of us can, can, can overcome. I know I have to do that as well on a daily basis, that we have to kind of push through our own paralysis when we learn something and actually begin to do something. And in Maine and Free World, we've given people dozens of things for do. So actions that they can take in the marketplace, sending letters to their local um, uh, local leaders, federal leaders. Uh, we're partnering with IJM and Polaris Project on a new campaign that's going to be coming out here pretty soon where we're going to need people to be a part of it. We're partnered with the End It Movement, which really is taking hold of the idea that awareness is action and you have to constantly push. So what, what I think people need to do first is prepare themselves to not disenfranchise just because they know something. Yeah. You've got to push through it. That's the, that's the number one challenge that I've seen, the one, number one thing I've learned over the last year, is just kind of get over it and, and, and push through and start taking actions. Even if they seem small, you'll find something in yourself that starts to feel connected, even if it's sending letters, which I know seems very small and insignificant, 
those things, every action that we've prepared for people is, is laser focused and target rich to the ivory towers that we need on our side. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to have, at the end of this uh, Hangout, we're going to post uh, immediately on the event page links to everyone who's participating's websites so uh, people can go and learn more. Um, but I think take Justin's larger point to heart here. I'm going to switch now to and uh, introduce Greg Darley from the International Justice Mission, who's a director of uh, college mobilization at IJM. He's going to speak to uh, opportunities uh, for a campaign they're running around student involvement. Greg, welcome. Sorry, I was un unmuting there. Thank you. Thanks for uh, thanks for having us. We're glad to have you. So tell us about tell us about what you guys are doing. Yeah. Uh, well, first I want to thank Justin for giving me a new word for my boss, a Hauganism, and so I will be using that with Gary. Uh, thanks, Justin, for that, Jim. But yeah, so I help I help with our lead our college mobilization team, and so we are engaging college students all around the nation. And actually, what we're finding is there are college students and young people around the world that really do want to come together um, in the masses and say that, hey, this is an issue uh, that matters to us and we don't just want to know about it, we actually want to do something about it. And so one of the things that we've learned and it's when you're in this, like Justin said, when you wake up every day and this is your job, for me what I found is that I actually forget that a lot of people just don't know that slavery exists and especially not to the level that it does. And so the number one response when I'm on a college campus speaking or talking about our work is students, when you, when you tell them the level of, of injustice that's happening, the level of slavery, the number one response usually is, what? Like they just don't know. Um, and you know, so like, you know, to echo what Justin was saying, you know, doing awareness is doing the work. Um, you know, another Hauganism that we talk about a lot, one of the things that Gary says is, you know, nothing happens just because you are aware, um, but nothing certainly is going to happen until you are aware, right? And so for us with young people and students, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to really broaden that megaphone. We're trying to make uh, the megaphone as wide as possible, that billboard as wide as possible saying, hey, slavery exists, it exists at this level but we can actually do something about it. So can you tell us a little bit about what, what, the, what the program is and kind of how people can get involved if they want to? Yeah, so, so we started this campaign called Stand for Freedom, and we, <laughs> we tried it with a few schools in this, this past fall. Uh, so we had six schools do Stand for Freedom events uh, before we try to roll this thing out nationwide. And so what it is, it's a really simple way uh, to equip students and give them resources to wake up their campus to the fact that slavery exists and that we can do something about it. So Stand for Freedom, it's a 27-hour standing vigil for the 27 million slaves. And so students are literally standing on their campus and you know trying to broadcast it out to everyone walking by, to everyone in the community that slavery exists. So they have 27 hours um, to raise their voice and so what we're asking all of these students to do is, you know, find a prominent pe place on campus, you know, in your community, whether it's, you know, the, you know um, in the quad or downtown, get, you know, get people involved. So we're seeing, you know, massive, massive amounts of students signing up. Um, so it's going to happen in March. So it's March 5th through the 15th, and we're asking students find a 27-hour window within those 10 days rally your friends, grab a group of people, um, stand for 27 hours. Um, now, not all students are standing for all 27 hours. A lot of them are, you know, standing in, you know, pockets of time between classes and when they can. Uh, we're asking all the students to, to raise awareness, to raise money, and also raise their voice. And so we've partnered, the, our students team, we've partnered with our government relations team, which does a lot of the, the lobbying, a lot of trying to, you know, here on the Hill trying to get our politicians to know that, hey, this is an issue that we matter, uh, that matters to us. And so we have uh, the Make Freedom Real campaign, which we're trying to get 150,000 people to sign this uh, petition that we're sending to the White House because uh, the administration last fall said, hey, human trafficking is an issue. We know it matters to you. And so it matters to us and we want to help. And so we're basically trying to call them, you know, to account on that. Hey, you you know, President Obama gave, you know, a full speech about human trafficking, about slavery. 
um, last fall. And so now we're saying, hey, you talked about it, and now we're asking you to act. So part of the Stand for Freedom is we want all students across all campuses to sign this. And, you know, I want to help deliver hopefully way more than 150,000 signatures to the White House saying, all right, we're here uh, and we're not going away. So we want you to do something. Um, so as a, I just checked a second ago, so as of this morning, we have over 300 schools that have signed up to, to do Stand for Freedom. And so there, we know there are a lot more students. So the easiest thing to do is to go to the website igm.org slash stand. If your school is already uh, listed, then you can just sign up and join, you know, join that uh, event that's going to happen. If your school is not listed, hey, be a leader, you know, create the event. You'll get connected with resources on how you can rally your campus to do that. That's great. Very tangible. and goes right along with Justin and the ambassador's points about um, there's all sorts of things, and these all add up with their impact uh, collectively. I want to bring in another voice here um, from Historians Against Slavery, which Ambassador DeBaca uh, mentioned earlier on, uh, Historians Against Slavery is a wonderful organization uh, that is that actually consulted uh, with Justin and I on the creation of the film Journey to Freedom, uh, but also are doing great work leading this academic connection, uh, but also working on campuses. And uh, Matt Mason from Brigham Young University is going to join us here. Uh, and Matt uh, has led several showings of the film Journey to Freedom uh, on and around the BYU campus. And this is another thing that people can do, which is show our film. Uh, that's, what we, that's what we made it for, so it can be used and have impact. And it's available on the Freedom Center website uh, and, on, and through YouTube. So uh, Matt's, Matt, tell us a little bit about um, Historians Against Slavery as well as what you've been doing with the film and the reaction you've been getting. Okay, great. Matt, uh, I think you're mute. You think you're I think I'm unmuted. I thought I was unmuted. Oh, no, you're good. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Am I... I thought I was unmuted. <laughs> you are. You're on a little bit of a delay, so just go ahead. And okay. Follow on. Well, Historians Against Slavery uh, began with this incredible historian, James Brewer Stewart, uh, and his incredible passion for this issue as a distinguished historian of abolition. He, uh, he got a, a whole group of us involved beginning in about 2010, and uh, we, what we want to do is we have all these activists out in the out in the uh, anti human trafficking community that we want to help by informing what they're doing uh, by this historical perspective that you were talking about earlier in the in in this uh, in this hangout. Uh, we find I have found every time I've met with activists that they really do appreciate that historical uh, perspective, and that has included these times when we have uh, when I've shown the film to a variety of different. Uh, groups of people. <coughs> Is that enough on it? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Go, and go ahead and tell, tell us a little bit about the, uh, maybe about, quickly about what, how you show the film, you know, what you've done, and then the reaction you've gotten from folks about how it's right. Been. Right. I, uh, I have shown it to groups of students at uh, Brigham Young University. I've shown it to uh, teachers in the, in a school district uh, here as part of a training that I did. I've, I've shown it to um, some of my classes as well as to the uh, our BYU Free the Slaves Club. And uh, I've found a variety of reactions. I think two main themes uh, emerge from this. Whether showing the film or any other time I've talked about uh, this issue with people, I, I, I agree with uh, other things that have been said during this hangout. That I get three main reactions. One is the shock. Uh, that, that comes with knowing about this issue for the first time. Then immediately, what can I do to help? And then almost immediately after that, a feeling of, as uh, Justin Dillon was talking about, kind of uh, paralysis. It's this enormous issue uh, so, uh, that it's very hard to get your, your uh, hands around, global issue, what can I, one person do? And that's what has been really useful about the film, is this narrative of a network. Uh, of people. It's the exact opposite narrative of, say, the movie Lincoln, uh, which has been so popular now that focuses so very tightly on the normal story of emancipation. Lincoln just made it happen. Uh, one guy, and we know we're not Lincoln, so we, we feel a, a sense of paralysis because uh, the, if that's the narrative of how emancipation happened in the 19th century, we know we're not going to be part of that narrative. And so the power of the film um, is this idea of the network. Early on in the process, we had 
toyed with this idea of what if we just broke out the Solomon Northup and uh, Binoc, or Prune Binoc stories and, and had that available as just a segment of the film, because there's a certain power to that narrative. But, but as I've shown it to, especially our uh, group of student activists here at BYU, they said, no, don't lose the, old, the whole film, because the whole film, especially with that graphic of the, of the network, both then and now, tells exactly that, that story that we're telling, that you don't have to uh, be an all-powerful one person that can solve this problem. If you are a, a lawyer, you can do this. If you are a, you know, a, or a law student, you can do this. If you are a, a social worker, you can do this. If you're a historian, you can, you can even uh, pitch in and so forth. So that has been a really powerful uh, message. The student leaders of our, of our club have seen about a million films about modern slavery. And one of the things they appreciated about Journey to Freedom was they, they said almost unanimously, ah, at last, a hopeful film. Uh, that some more that they can take a, a hopeful message out of, uh, out of the narrative that this film tells. And so uh, I, I don't think we should ever lose that network uh, aspect of the, of the narrative of the film. That's great, Matt. I mean, in many ways, that's the perfect summation of this entire conversation today, because I think that's uh, you know, where we, what we're trying to say. And I think I certainly hope that what would come out of this film, and it's really, really, really wonderful to hear that's the reaction you're getting. Um, we are unfortunately just about out of time. Um, there have been several questions, many of which were for the ambassador, so we did get a chance to ask, ask some of those. Um, there's one last question which I'm going to try to answer on some little level, which is really it, it touching on what a lot of us are talking about uh, around what are, what are the other ways that people can get involved. We've heard from uh, the IJM Student Action. We've heard from what Justin mentioned about uh, both consumer actions, but also uh, ways that you can get involved in the political process in some way and just make this uh, more of a publicly responded to issue. And of course, Matt speaking to what people can do on campuses or in their neighborhoods with the showing of this film. I want to quickly plug two other organizations who, uh, or three other organizations who I think I would also want to refer people to. One is a great organization called the Frederick Douglass Family Foundation, which uh, develops curriculum around, actually is formed by a direct descendant of Frederick Douglass himself, uh, a great guy named Ken Morris. And they uh, have curriculum for high school and junior high age students uh, that really connects this issue in, in the way that we're all talking about here, but directly um, targeted at um, service learning and taking action as young people. Uh, so maybe lower age group than what we've been talking about in this hangout. There's also going to be a wonderful, uh, the, the National American History Museum is putting on a, a national youth summit on February 11th that is in conjunction with the abolitionists um, miniseries on PBS. Uh, I will, we're going to put websites for all this on the event page afterwards, but that youth summit is going to have opportunities for regional uh, youth summits that will network into it. In fact, we're doing that at the Freedom Center. Uh, and that's another great way right now in the next couple uh, weeks that folks can get involved uh, at a younger age level, but also teachers can be involved with that as well. And then finally, there's an organization or a website called End Slavery Now which is uh, really aspiring to be a catch-all. It can really be a place where you can learn about a lot of different activity. Uh, and it'll link you out to a lot of different organizations. So I'd recommend folks visit that, organi that website as well. Um, we're now a little bit past one, so I, I'm going to uh, have to, uh, unfortunately for me, because I have really quite enjoyed this say goodbye to this hangout today. I want to thank uh, deeply everybody for participating today. Um, and I want to thank all of you for tuning in. Uh, please also note you can. This will be uh, archived on our YouTube site um, uh, for for viewing beyond this. So please share it with anyone who you think might be interested by this who didn't get a chance to see it today. Um, Greg, Justin, Matt, Ambassador, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Luke. Thanks for doing it. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Thanks for having us. Take care, everyone. <laughs>